On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Dave Ramsey helped me get focused on a budget. He helped me see the picture of the debt snowball method. His ideas got me angry at my debt. So these are all good things. That's right. I got so into Dave and his, his teachings that I basically had not just drunk the Kool-Aid, I was swimming around in it. What if there was a better way? What if there was? Would you want to know about it? And how much of your money would you want to put into it? What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast, coming back to you here today with another king on the stage, my brother, Mark Willis. How we doing? Hey, Chaz. Glad to be on, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you bringing a conversation that I am just so close-knitted to, this idea of building wealth in my business, out of my business, and all different strategies that I know that you help your clients with. So I am excited for this conversation. Tell us, I kind of already spilled the beans, but tell us what kind of business that you got. Yeah, I'm, so I've had the great privilege over the last decade and a half almost working with clients who are business owners, real estate investors, even some NFL Super Bowl champions, Chaz. But most of the people I work with are just wanting more control over their financial life. Many times they'll come to me saying, hey, Mark, you know, I kind of feel like I'm just a tennis ball floating down the gutter of the financial universe and I'm just kind of getting beat up and fees getting like leeches on my back, just letting the blood out as I go down this, this gutter of life. And they want more control. They want to be able to swim upstream. They want to be able to, you know, reach their financial objectives without taking all this unnecessary risk that seems to be endemic in the kind of the oh so average way of doing money, this money thing. Yeah. So yeah, we, I'm a certified financial planner and I, many people refer to me as not your average financial planner because we offer solutions and strategies that are counterintuitive to your typical stock jockeys or investment gurus or radio infotainers. And we help people become, you know, set for life and become their own source of financing to help them take back control of their own finances. Love it. Yeah. The, the not so average financial advisor, also name of your podcast, which is a great show. And so they can check you out there as well. We'll put that in the show notes, but you you come with a unique perspective and, and I want to tell just, I want to set you up here <clears throat> because my first interactions with a financial planner, I was probably 24, 25. I maybe had a business or two at that point. And, and he wanted me to sit down and, and, and do the thing that you've probably referenced as the other, you know, people. <laughs> and yep. I just wanted him to tell me what he had done and knowing that he was a business owner, we met at a networking thing, like what he had done with his money. And he just thought that was so offensive. That I would ask him really? what he had done with his money first. And I wanted him to show me. I didn't want him just to tell me. I wanted him to show me. And I know that that was probably a little bit of a reach for me, a little bit of an agitator, you know, like, however, what you have said is I don't want to just take money from a person who has W-2 and then they have no other options because as a business owner, I can make a lot of money with my money. I know how mm -hmm. to make a lot of money inside of my business or businesses. And so for me to partner or to trust someone in the financial space like you that, that can give me extra options that are as good as my business is super intriguing, I think, to most everybody in the business space and everybody listening here today. So I just set you up on a stage. Tell us yeah. why, 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 what, like what about this is so unique? Well, first of all, you were right to call the chef out into the restaurant to see if he eats his own cooking. Yeah. That is not a offensive. I would. I'm surprised that he was. I'm not surprised. I'm. I'm. I. I recognize why he would have done such a thing. But isn't it very revealing that hey, you're you have to show your underwear to this guy. Not literally, but your financial. Yeah. You have to financially undress basically all of your assets and debts and concerns and dreams and goals. And yet he has to be this stoic priest behind a a veiled curtain or whatever. No. No, listen, they don't have it all figured out, okay? No one is the Wizard of Oz who can see into the future of what the stock market is going to do. In fact, there's a reason why they call them investment brokers, because the truth is they're probably broker than you are. So you have to really be careful when you're dealing with financial, again, investment gurus and stock jockeys and people who would love to tell you that you can get 12% a year on your mutual funds and index funds easier than falling off a log. I'm sorry, it's not true. Here's the third party research done by independent studies. Okay, they don't have a dog in this fight. What would you expect the stock market to have done over a 30 year period, Chaz, if you were to put money into all equities? Okay, so that's stocks, 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 no bonds, 
you know, over, over a 30 year period, according yeah. to Dalbar, which is the third party research firm out of Boston, they say, according to their research, that you'd get about 3.6% per year out of the stock market wow. over a 30 year period. Wow. Now, it's not the eight to 12 that we hear. Yeah, exactly. It's shocking. And what a waste, you know, over that long a period of time. That's hardly keeping up with inflation, certainly not keeping up with today's inflation rates. Yeah. So what's the deal there? And by the way, that is after fees, okay, but before taxes are factored in. So oh, if wow. you ta take uh, taxes out of that, we're looking in the middle 2% range yeah. out of the stock market. Now, your statement, my statement on my 401k, if I had one, I don't have a 401k, candidly, would say, oh, 8% rate of return, 10%. Well, how is that possible? Here's the truth. Chaz, let's say you have 10,000 bucks in an in a investment. Okay, you put that 10,000 bucks into the magical investment box and it gives you a amazing 100% rate of return in the first year. You went from 10 grand all the way up to 20 grand. Yeah. Wow, you're loving life, so you stick with that investment. Unfortunately, in year two, that $20,000 gets cut in half, a negative 50% market decline. You went from 20,000 back down to your original $10,000 after the second year. Jazz, do you feel any wealthier? You put in 10 grand, it went up to 20. It came back down to 10. Do you feel any wealthier after all that heartache? I can't, I can't imagine so. Not at all, Now, So the math works out, you got a 0% return, right? That's clear. However, your statement on your uh, investment statement would say an average rate of return of 25%. Be How is that possible? <laughs> Again, 100 minus 50 divided yeah. by two is 25%. Yeah. That's the average. This is what the SEC allows investment statements to report. It's what most investment advisors are taught to talk about with you. But you know, and I know, that I cannot spend a rate of return at the grocery store. Yeah. All right, I can only spend cash. And right. your money went up and then down and you're back at where you started. And oh, by the way, there probably were some fees given to the investment buddy who was doing all this investing for you. Yeah. He or she was the only one with any guarantees in that project. Yeah. You assumed all the risk. Now, as a business owner, that makes me mad. I hope, I hope it makes your listeners and you mad as well that yeah. you know, this investment scheme gives all the guarantees and power and control away to some other person who can retire before you could on your own money and you're left holding all the bag with all the risk. So you asked a question, what are some options? Well, there's, there's certainly a world of options outside of the stock market, outside of the typical oh so average ways of investing that I think actually accelerate your goals in your business. I believe in you, man. I think you should believe in yourself. Your business is your own greatest investment and you are your own personal best asset in your portfolio. Yeah. So by dumping investment into your businesses, you can get a great rate of return. I don't think the market holds a candle to what you can do. Now, there's a lot of risk in, in running a business. You know this. I know this. A lot of risk there. So the best research says that you need to counterbalance that business investment like a barbell. You know, On one side is your business. On the other side should be a risk-free asset that you have liquid access to so that you can grab it when you need to to fund your business ventures or to cover that emergency or to cover that you know, new opportunity or real estate deal or whatever. Yeah. And that's what I really specialize in, helping the business owner counterbalance his or her investment on that side of the barbell with the other side of the barbell, which are risk-free, even guaranteed assets that are liquid, tax-free or tax-advantaged and under their control that they don't have to go beg in a bank when it's time to get some access to capital. They can be their own bank and actually fire their banker at the bank down the street and become their own source of financing instead. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. I'm sure that we have the listeners on the edge of their seat. <laughs> How is this possible? <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's come out of the practicality of, of wealth building for a half second. And I want to go into the story of Mark because you've been doing this for a minute. And, and by a minute, I mean you've helped a lot of people and you and making a lot of other people successful, but, but particularly you. Why? Why is this exciting to Mark? Why is wealth building or helping people or why is money? What, what is the swirl in your world that makes it go for you? What's the, what's the bottom line? Yeah, you know, I graduated from graduate school with uh, six figures of student loan debt. Wow. 
Wow. And entered into my married life with a second wife. Her name is Sally May. <laughs> was Sally May. I married my beautiful bride and also Sally May came along for the ride and we wanted her out of the marriage, out of the relationship. Yeah. But we didn't know how. And we graduated in 2008 when they weren't exactly hiring. If you think back to what was going on in the economy at that time. Yeah. So for me and my wife, it was a, it was a race to stay alive. It was a, and the debt around our neck felt like a, a, a weight pulling us underwater. Yeah. And we had to fight like every single day to stay above water and, and to just survive. And so I know that money is just a thing. It's just a number on a screen or green stuff in your back pocket. It's one of the four currencies. You know, there's money. There's also time. There's also energy. There's also attention. It's why we spend our time with people we love. It's why we pay attention, right? So it's one of the four currencies. And I found that money has so many like fingers into every other important area of our life. And I found myself really enjoying those long grab a cigar, or grab a drink kind of conversations with people that mattered under the stars. And I felt like most of the time, the conversations I was having about my money with, with people mattered. You know, it wasn't the money thing. It was what money allowed me to do or kept me from doing. Yeah. You know, when I was un in debt up to my eyeballs, I felt like a slave. Now that I'm more than debt free, uh, I feel like I've got some control and some access and can do wonderful things in the world and can give generously and, and run my business and support our employees and more. And so money, it makes you more of who you already are inside. I, I guess that's maybe one way to think about it. And so as my wife and I began to develop our own theology and philosophy of money, it really got us thinking, all right, well, how could we introduce concepts like this to other people such that they were not just better off with a net worth going up, because yeah. who cares about that, right? It's just a number. How could we encourage people to live a thriving life where they had a financial statement of purpose where they knew exactly, all right, here's exactly what we want our money to do for us. Here's how we want it to act for us. Rather than us chasing the almighty dollar, let's get our money thinking and let's think about what we want our money to do for us. What characteristics do we want it to have? Yeah. You know, do we want it to be tied up into a 401k where we can't touch it until we're 59 and a half when we're finally adults in the government size and can access our own <laughs> money, for goodness sakes. So these sorts of things got us really interested. And so we started the firm Lake Growth Financial Services, and we've been working with clients in all 50 states ever since. Yeah, love that. Let's, let's talk about what you just said about the government dubbing us adults at 59 and a half and even giving us access to our own money. I love that because I don't like being put in a box and no entrepreneur does. It's for entrepreneurs. But there is a thing called discipline. And so how have you married this idea of discipline, which most don't have? And in addition to that, most entrepreneurs don't have because they're a little squirrely, typically. So you have this, this person that doesn't really like, they don't even want discipline, really. That's why they're an entrepreneur. They just want to do their own thing. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to, I'm not speaking to you, listener. I'm just, I'm speaking to the other listener, right? <laughs> Maybe speaking to me as the younger person. Okay, fine. But how, so you're giving me freedom or access, right, to be able to grow my wealth without the box. But where does discipline come in in all this? Because you seem like a yeah. pretty disciplined individual. Well, you're exactly right. And this is something I think, again, ties to something much deeper than we probably have time to get into on today's podcast. But there's freedom from and then there's freedom for. You know, many people think they want freedom from their W-2 job. Because they've been there all these years and they, it's a soul-sucking existence and they want freedom from the day job or the boss or the mean old, you know, manager or whatever. And then they start their business and then they go bankrupt. Why? Because all they were doing was running away. Yeah. They weren't running toward anything. They were just running away. And you're right. The only discipline they had was the feeling of pain. Any toddler can pull their hand away from a hot stove. That's not discipline. You know, what we want before we start that business is to be running toward something. What are we doing this for? What is our freedom for? And I feel like that really is, inter it's an interesting question. Someone once said, Mark, there is no rights without a responsibility attached to it. And if you're going to have freedom, like the freedom of speech or whatever, there also comes with it a responsibility. Yeah. What is my responsibility to my fellow man or whatever? If I'm going to be free to start a business, well, that's an incredible privilege, but what now is my responsibility? 
what am I doing this for? Is it for legacy? Is it for my employees? Is it for my children? Is it for the charities I want to support? What am I doing it for? And then discipline, I think, comes out of that. Slowly but surely, we start to say, all right, you know what? I'm not going to blow this money on the latest software or ice cream cone. I'm going to go after something that's going to last and will actually help build and grow my business. I don't know. That's my best answer yeah. in a short time frame. There's lots more we could talk about there, I'm sure. I love it. I, I want to bring maybe a maybe a good name, maybe a, maybe a you know a polarizing name to the conversation here. But some of the things you just said, as far as staying away from the ice cream cone or the the proverbial latte, it sounds a little Dave Ramsey. And so how 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 does that maybe really conservative approach fall into what you do with entrepreneurs? I know there's a lot of people that love and hate that philosophy. Where do you stand? Well, you know, hey, he Dave Ramsey helped me get focused on a budget. Right. He helped me see the picture of the debt snowball method. His ideas got me angry at my debt. So these are all good things. That's right. I got so into Dave and his, his teachings that I basically had not just drunk the Kool-Aid, I was swimming around in it. <laughs> and my mentor sat me down one afternoon. He had traveled. He was a professor from my college. He came over to visit us in Chicago. He knew I was drowning in all that student loan debt. He knew I was a Dave Ramsey you know, disciple. And he looked at me and he said, Mark, I have something important to talk to you about. And he started to explain this strategy that ultimately changed my financial life and my family tree. Wow. But at first he had to say, Mark, he looked at me right in the eye and he said, Mark, is it possible that Dave Ramsey could be wrong about something? And he just let that question hang there in the air. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you could hear the cracking sound of my mind opening, finally opening. <laughs> uh, because I had always just thought, oh, Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey. Yeah, he, he, he wrote the fifth gospel on money. <laughs> you know, he brought it all down from the, from the mountaintop and it, everything he says drips with honey and truth. That's but right. it's it's not true. Unfortunately, he's human. I, I guess, you know, that's an obvious statement, but I needed someone to say that to me. Mark, is it possible? And that, to me, I think is the most important thing. You cannot have a financial guru in your life. You must be your own financial guru. Nobody's going to care more about your money than you do. Yeah. Not Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey doesn't even have a financial license. He has a radio license, but he does not have any financial licenses. He let those go a long time ago. He's a radio infotainer and that's okay. Yep. So does he have my best interest at heart? Well, of course not. He's a radio guy. My job is to really think for myself and ask critical thinking questions. And that's something I just hadn't done uh, with, with Mr. Dave or Susie Orman or pick your infotainers out there today, Jim Kramer. Right. So these are all things that I think really we have to decide what is it that they're saying that's helpful? What is it that's not helpful? And let's discern critical thinking skills. Yeah, I love I love that uh, that answer. I'm turning this into a mindset question for you, but that response was well thought out. And so thank you for that and it was it was very balanced in the way of yes and. And so for you, there's a maturity that gets there because someone who maybe hasn't gotten there maybe sees that answer as um like a tickling of the ears on both sides, you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's just a really well thought out answer and it like it served kind of both answers. I see that it was mature in the response of, I like some things, but I don't have to like all of the things, which is really in, in today's political environment, business environment. I mean, that, that's just like, you have to pick a side and I don't yep, actually, agree. Side. yeah, I don't agree with that at all. And it sounds like from your answer that you don't agree with that. What is that yeah. mindset or where does that stem from for you? Well, listen, he calls them the baby steps. Okay. Baby steps. If, if I was just a baby, then taking baby steps makes great sense. Right. If I was only able to do baby steps now at my age, that would, my doctor would be concerned. Yeah. Okay. There'd be a problem. So let's put Dave where he belongs, you know, and say, all right, maybe there's something beyond what he has to share with me. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm happy that he got me focused and mentally like in the right gear to yeah. pay off my debt rather than chasing the ice cream cone. I'm now chasing the payoff of the debt. Here's where things I disagreed vehemently with Dave Ramsey on a few topics. And if you want, I can dive into those. I'd, I'd be tickling the ears too, I'm sure some audience members. So one is the debt snowball method. All right. So I was following that method and listen, he tells you to get a thousand bucks and to leave it in your savings account. Well, how many expenses can you think of that are going to be costing you more than a thousand bucks? Pretty much all. How many times <laughs> did I fall back into debt? Because you know, I had an emergency while I'm trying to pay off all this $120,000 of student loan debt. Right. I get a flat tire or two and I'm, I'm falling back, falling back down into credit card land. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's my first problem. The second is every time I spend a dollar, and this is maybe the wake up call of my financial adult life, you finance everything you buy. All right, you finance everything you buy. You can either pay interest to a bank for a car, right? right? A payment on the car loan or whatever. You pay interest to the banker for the car, or you save up and pay cash and you pass up the interest you could have earned on that money had you not bought the car and left the money invest and stay invested instead. Yeah. You're financing it from your future self when you pay cash. And that is devastating. It is. Let's say your car was 40 grand, 40 grand for a car these days, you know? Wow. That's (laughs) if you paid cash for a a car. Yeah. The sticker price said $40,000, but you know, that might end up costing the expense of that, the lost opportunity cost of that $40,000 in your savings or investment account might be 150 grand over your lifetime. Yep. That's for one stinking car. That's scary. You know, multiply that out over eight, 10 cars, and we're talking about a million bucks just for cars. My biggest problem is the lost opportunity that comes from paying cash. Yeah. And so I had to find myself, I was struggling because I was in this quandary. How do I pay off my student loans? What's better than the debt snowball method? We eventually trademarked it. We now call it the debt snow bank method, which I could share with you if you want, but it had major ramifications for my, my wife and I. And we had to ultimately grow beyond the guru on the radio. Yeah. Well, yes, we want you to tell us the snowbank method before we do the everything that you just said. And this is for the listener, because me being an entrepreneur in multiple different industries and uh, having a quasi level of success at a fairly young age, everything that, that Mark just said is exactly what I know to be true because there every decision that i make because i'm a very very disciplined entrepreneur and i and i i'm calculating decisions like this that you just described and i'm going well i can't i don't even want to buy it at all you know and and, and really i have to give myself a little grace sometimes to to spend the money on the things that bring us joy because i'm so calculated in the things that are going to either make me more money or provide a a future wealth benefit to my grandchildren where I, the $40,000 car or the $150,000 car, I'm like, that would be silly. I've talked about being able to buy a Lambo cash for years now. And it's like, well, but why would I ever do that? Like just, mm. oh my gosh. Like I'm just thinking of the millions of dollars that that represents in real estate or another asset that my grandkids are being robbed so that I could drive some fancy car. It's like, okay, well maybe one day, maybe one day when it just doesn't matter and I'm just like swimming in it. I don't know. But like, as of right now, I'm just super calculated. So everything that you're saying, I'm just like, yes. Now, with that being said, hurry up quick. Tell us this snowbank, this method. Well, hey, you got to buy stuff in life. You know, there's not like we're going to just live and starve ourselves into prosperity here. Right. So there's going to be things we've got to get around town. We got to invest in that real estate, even, even investing in real estate. So I wanted to find, well, I'm going to I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff in life because life costs money. And plus, I wanted to find good ways to invest and not just be debt free. I wanted to be better than debt free. I wanted to call Dave Ramsey up and scream, I'm better than debt free. So I said to myself, well, what can I do that's better than this snowball method? And again, I stumbled across this strategy. It's, It's referred to as bank on yourself. And it uses, of all things, Chaz, it uses a 200 year old asset that's grown in value every year, guaranteed, literally in the contract. They have an increased guarantee in the contract every year. It's dividend paying whole life insurance of all things. Yeah. And as you know, right now, if you're like me as a Dave Ramsey disciple, formerly known as, my mind immediately shut off when my mentor told me about bank on yourself. Yeah. I thought, okay, well, Dave Ramsey says it must be wrong, so it must be true. And that's when the, the proverbial question, Mark, is it possible? that Dave Ramsey could be wrong about something. Yeah. That started that question started me on a 7 month digging experience, exploration process, and I found that if it's designed properly, this particular design of whole life insurance can do some pretty remarkable things. I was very compelled and now as a certified financial planner, I can't look away from it. It's a very interesting strategy. It's not a good fit for everybody. So let me briefly, Chaz, explain what it is, and then I'll tell you how the debt snowbank method fits in. So we can do this really quick. I'll try to do this in just a few minutes. There's a rabbit hole that you could go down here. I'm sure. Um, If it's properly structured, we'll call this 
bank on yourself type whole life insurance because not all whole life insurance is created equal or designed properly. Right. If it's designed properly, first, the cash value, which is different than the death benefit. So there's a, there is certainly a death benefit with these policies, but there's also something called cash value. And the cash value is what we can access on this side of the grass, let's say, while we're alive. Okay. So that cash value is liquid and available with no tax due if we design it properly for any purpose at any age for any reason. So I can use the cash value for, you know, real estate investing. I can use it for buying my car, paying off my student loans, fixing up my kitchen, sending my kid to college, you know, a business acquisition or inventory purchase, whatever I want to use that money for. There's no prohibited transactions. I can be 39 years old or 59 years old. There is no government telling me I have to be a certain age to get access to this money. It's my money. Okay. So that's the first piece. Second, the cash value itself grows, as I said, on a predictable, even guaranteed schedule. So I know every single year, no matter what's happening in the world or, or in the stock market, my money is going to be more than it was last year. I'll have a higher net worth on a guaranteed basis every single year. And if we build it properly, they can throw dividends on top of that guarantee as well. Uh, third, it is life insurance. So I'm going to leave my family what I want to save for them and leave for them more than I could put into the policy automatically because it's designed to be life insurance. And then the final piece, and this is the very interesting piece for me as a business owner, I can use that cash value like a line of credit to myself. It's almost like a bank for myself. Right. I can borrow against my cash value and the policy itself will continue to grow and compound as if I had not touched the money. Right. So let me give you a quick example and then I'll hush and get your feedback on all this. Let's say I have $100,000 in cash value. So that's free and clear. I can do whatever I want with it. I can withdraw that money and just cash it out and walk away. It's my money. Or I can borrow against that cash value. Let's say I borrowed against the $100,000 of cash value to go buy a $40,000 car because I had to do it. Okay. All right. My policy will continue to compound and grow on the full $100,000, even on the 40 grand I'd used to go buy the car. Right. And now I'm in control to repay that loan to the policy that I own and control at whatever pace and rate I wish. So that, that's the big picture, guarantees, liquidity, tax advantages, and continuous compound growth on our money for the rest of our lives. Hey, kings and queens, Chaz Wolf. I want to talk to you about something that's super important to me. We put a lot of time and effort, we meaning myself and my team, into this podcast, into the content that goes out every single day. And if you have been getting any sort of value or insight from this, we want it to be able to reach other business owners too. So we would love if you would like, comment, share, leave a review, post, share again, <laughs> all of the things on social media, on all the different platforms, or even on the podcast mediums of Apple and Spotify. We would love to be able to get our content into more hands, more entrepreneurs, so they can grow their business as quick as possible. Together, we are building a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their businesses to new heights. So let's do this. Let's help each other. Let's help each other grow. Yeah. Where in the portfolio as someone's building, because it, it seems as if maybe this is one of the foundational pieces and then all the other moves can come out of this is what I'm hearing you say. But for someone who maybe has already, you know, made some moves, <clears throat> maybe they got a couple of businesses or a couple pieces of real estate and they're thinking, okay, this is maybe the first time I've heard this. Where, how do I start? putting this into motion. Nassim Tlaib, he wrote a book called The Anti-Fragile. Anti-Fragile is the name of the book. Okay. And he talks about this barbell strategy. So on one side of the barbell, you have a risk asset like your business or even a real estate deal. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you put a risk-free asset, which would be whole life insurance. Anything with a contractual guarantee is going to be on the risk-free side of the, of the spectrum. So these policies are never going to give us you know, double-digit rate of return, right. really. You're going to be middle single digit, boring, regular, steady as she goes kind of returns. But it's that compounding that doesn't stop that really entices me. Right. So if I'm going to get 5%, let's say, on my policy for the rest of my life on, on an ongoing basis, even when I tap that money, it's still going to grow at the same rate and pace. And then I can go take that money and go buy a business with it that might give me 50% rate of return or 30%. Now I've just increased my market return without any additional you know, beta or, or risk or volatility. 
that to me is a, a storehouse for my wealth, for one, and then a line of credit for myself to go make opportunities um, actualized in the real world. Yeah, love it. What you've done is you've taken this and made it very, very particular for this, you know, risky individual who you know calls himself a a business owner or an entrepreneur. I, I love the approach of being balanced. I think that most people, especially ones that leave a job and open up a business or two or three or ten are kind of just running fast with the hair on fire of this direction. And we always think that it would be like, like it, whether it's a half second or whether it's multiple you know, moments that we spend thinking that it would be probably wise to kind of cover our backside or make sure that our grandchildren have something. But oftentimes the entrepreneur isn't thinking this way until maybe they just have just this major surplus. So what would you say to the guy listening right now or the gal listening right now that's a little bit earlier in their journey and they don't have gobs of money to maybe start a policy with. And how do, they, how do they go about it? Sure. Well, that was me. And I'll go ahead and wrap up with the snowbank explanation in Love brief it. as well. And I'll be brief about this. But yeah, that was me. My wife and I were, in, as I said, in debt up to our eyeballs. We didn't have really much in the way of savings, except that wonderful $1,000 that Dave Ramsey uh, made sure we had. So we just started what we could. What we did, and here's the debt snowbank method. Step one, we, we kept current on all of our debts. So we didn't go behind on anybody. Step two, instead of throwing all of our extra cash flow into our student loans, instead of doing that, and we instead opened up some whole life policies designed this way, this bank on yourself way, and we flooded those suckers with as much money as we could pack in, as much as we could handle, as comfortably could. There's a lot of flexibility with how you fund these things. It could be a couple hundred bucks a month. It could be a couple thousand bucks a month. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. You know, really, there's a lot of flexibility with how you design these. But for my wife and I, it's all we could do to throw a couple hundred bucks a month into to one or two of those to get started. And our student loans were coming down slowly. Our policies were growing quickly as we were flooding that, those policies with as much money as we could. So the debt was coming down. The policy's value was going up. And one by one, we would just borrow against our policies to wipe out our debts. So we were wiping out our student loans. Yet the policy was continuing to grow as if we had not borrowed the money against the policy. So we were better than debt free, right? Now we're banking on ourselves. We bought back our student loans from, you know, the snakes at Sally May's office. And now we're paying ourselves back. And so we did. And then we've since paid off that student loan to ourselves. And now we're better than debt free. We've since used that money, of course, to use it for, you know, house down payments and business acquisitions and car purchases trips, you know, a month long trip to Hawaii. That was a lot of fun. So it can be as simple as sitting down with someone like myself or one of my colleagues who can look at your financial situation and see if this is even the right fit. You know, it's, it's not a good fit for everybody. So keep that in mind. Again, if, if you cannot save or if you just need triple digit returns with every penny you have, you're going to be bored to tears with whole life insurance at all. Even bank on yourself designed policies. We cut the cut, uh, expenses and commissions out of these things as much as possible, but they're still going to be slow growing, you know, as compared to the best year of the stock market. Right. But it's a slow and steady wins the race kind of strategy. Yeah. So yeah, a couple hundred bucks a month is probably where it would start. Or if you have some money already set aside in savings, I just helped a young couple in their mid twenties. They got some money from their wedding, and they're starting that policy with the money from their wedding. Yeah. You know, it could be awesome. even simple stuff like that. So. And what a cool thing to have compound growth for the rest of your marriage, rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think there's a lot of value there. I think that the listener is at least intrigued. And so, of course, like you said, they should reach out and get more information for sure. We'll, we'll give them that opportunity in the show notes. But let's talk about your journey again. Now you've gotten into business and you're, you've got the, 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 the bank process that you just described, but now you're a business owner on top of it. Give us something practical inside of you building that business where it's just been a good decision. It could be financial related or maybe just you know, like system wise. Give us something that we can repeat inside of our own businesses that you would keep doing over and over if you had the chance. Yeah, processes, I think, are what save us from the poverty of our intentions. Somebody said that and I can't remember who the. Who <laughs> that was good. The, uh, Say that again. Yeah, well, p processes save us from the poverty of our own intentions. Yeah. And there's a quote out there. Someone can look that up to figure out who said that quote. You know, originality is just forgetting your sources, Chaz, as you know. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's so true. You know, yeah. I might have the intention to whatever, lose weight, but 
there's that really nice bag of chips over there, man. And it's looking pretty good. Yep. But if I have a process like, hey, you know, I'm going to you know, only eat after 3 p.m. every day or something, and that's my process, and I, I just automatically fall into that process, right. then it's easier for me to walk past that bag of chips or bowl of ice cream. And same is true with our business. If we have a process, then it's, you know, we have a process, let's say, to follow up on a lead, for example. Every Monday at 10 a.m., I'm going to call brand new potential leads. Then yep. I don't have to wake up and how do I feel today and how do I, what should I do? And hey, that, that daytime TV is looking really cool today. So no, you just bypass all that mess and you follow your process. And oftentimes that can result in, in success. I have a feeling you have some ideas on this too, Chaz. What do you think about process as far as success goes? Well, I appreciate the the turn of the question there. Obviously, process are, are huge. And like you said, it's easy to walk by the bowl when you have uh, a process. It's also easy to create a process to remove the bowl. You know? Well said, yeah. Good and, point. and both both are the same thing, though. It, it, we're, we're, we're setting up our life ahead of time. So that way, in the moment, we make the right decision. And so for mm. you, inside the business... I mean, you get, you've given us several like pieces here in a row of like how we can do that early or even if we're already successful financially with the, the snowbank uh, method inside of the business for you. Was that, was that the following up on leads? Was that like, what was that where you like, once we did this, it like took off. Yeah. You know, it, it really became, how do we, how do we have important conversations in a way that happen on purpose? So when you have a financial business, like I have you're really in the business of aha moments with folks right. mm -hmm. because what, what you have to help them do is crack open their mind. Like I had mine cracked open and in that process, they think of things differently. And that's why we started our podcast. So every Friday we drop an episode as far as since 2017. And we're just trying to keep up with you, Chaz. I mean, you're <laughs> way ahead 400 plus we're in the mid three hundreds. So we're just Love trying it. to keep up. But the process of one, once a week, dropping that episode, yeah. introducing a concept that might just be the aha moment for somebody that that is the trick though because once we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person we want to consistently say hey have you thought about dot 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 here's a case in point one of the questions that i regularly ask folks when i sit down with them for a one-on-one -on -one advisory meeting is hey uh, i noticed that you're maxing out your 401k congratulations wonderful job living within your means I'm just curious, where do you think taxes over your lifetime are going? Are they going to go down or are they going to go up? And they all say up. They uh -huh. all say taxes are going up. And then I just ask them, is that a concern for you? Are you familiar with how this 401k will be taxed in retirement? Yeah. And they think there's this pause. You can hear the mind sizzling a uh -huh. little bit. Yep. And they say, wow, you know, I've never thought about that. And I say, well, you know, do you want to tax your seed or your harvest. So and good. they think about that. And there's some more aha moments. Okay. So our entire conversation where I'm digging into under understand their concern, maybe they'll tell me that they want to pay taxes on their seed today. But did you know that every 401k is going to get taxed on the harvest? That's right. But almost to a person, everyone wants to be a tax-free harvest. So their money is going into things that they don't always understand. And so those aha moments need to be Sit into a set into a system or a process so I don't forget to ask that question for Johnny. Right. If I ask Susie that question, how do I have that? I've got you know paperwork questions that I'm sure I'm going to check through these questions as I have the meetings with folks. It's been a lot of fun, and their responses are the best parts. Yeah, I can only imagine an entrepreneur. Again, maybe it might be different for uh, you know W two employee, but even if taxes didn't go up, would that person, as a business owner, anticipate that? They would be making more or less themselves, which then is going to change their tax bracket. Great point. Yeah, and, you're right. Yeah, here, here's hoping that you're making more money. And here's hoping your investments did well enough that that pushes you into a higher bracket in the future, too. So you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah, we, we, we don't oftentimes understand the second order consequences of our actions. Right. Well, and, and I've just learned, you know, through investments already that you can defer but eventually you're just going to make enough to where, I mean, unless you're just buying jets and on jets and jets and jets, you're going to have to pay tax at some point, my man. So, right. You, I mean, what, 
why 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 push it off later when it's going to be a higher a higher percentage? I, well, I think that's yeah. What does the word point. defer mean? I think sometimes just getting back to definitions. If I defer my root canal, how is that going to end up for me? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it takes it actually back to control, which you started this whole thing off by saying the reason why you work with entrepreneurs a lot of times is because we want to have control. And so that's right. a lot of times, uh, you know, business owners don't work with a financial planner because it doesn't feel like we're in control. And and working with someone like you with a methodology like this, it's like, OK, well, not only have you put us back in the driver's seat, but you're actually giving us strategies specifically today to work our money today differently that actually gives us more control. Again, it's betting on me. I'd rather I'd rather pay the tax now and bet on me now as opposed to hoping and praying for the future. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, we're recording this right before Halloween. Let me give a quick metaphor, okay? And I'll be brief as I can about this. But let's say you and me are going to go trick or treating together, okay? And you know, I'm not exactly a giant. Maybe folks are only listening to this. I'm not a giant, you know, like a bulking dude. I'm I'm okay. I'm I'm trying to hold my own weight here, but I'm not a big dude. And we go out trick or treating, and these bullies show up you to to you know intimidate us, and they say, "Hey, Jazz, hey, Mark, you know you can go trick or treating, that's fine, but when you come back, we're gonna take some of that candy of yours, and we're kind of shaking in our boots, and we're like, "Okay, I guess that's okay. Well, how much of our candy can we keep when we get back from all of our trick or treating and the bullies, because they hadn't thought through this part, they sort of look at each other and they're like, "You know what, Mark?" Jazz, we're going to vote on how much of that candy we take when you get back. Now, please understand how preposterous that would sound. How how motivated would you feel, Chaz, yeah. to even collect the candy right. if you didn't even know how much of it was even yours? That's right. And do you realize I just described the 401k or the IRA because Congress has not yet voted on how much of that 401k they own yet, wow. and they won't vote on it until you're retired and you can't do anything about it. So these are the things that I think lose the motivation, yeah. especially for the business owner. Especially. It certainly loses our feeling of control because we can't even tap that money. And what if there was a better way? What if there was? Would you want to know about it? And how much of your money would you want to put into it? Yeah, great questions. Okay, let's, let's flip the coin here. Let's talk about something that you've done that, should, that was darn near detrimental. It almost shut down the whole thing. I don't know. Give us some juicy details. Yeah, man, there's there's so many. <laughs> it's like, all right, it's Monday. Am I gonna, you know, there needs to be like a days days since the last accident right. sign on my, in my on my front door, you know? Yeah. I think the main piece is regularly choosing to muscle forward without asking people for help is the quintessential problem I have in my business. Okay. So how, how so? can I fire myself? How can I let somebody else do it eighty percent as well as I could do it? Yeah. Let them have it. I've learned now since then strategic ignorance. I'm thinking in particular of the paperwork part. I thought I would be able to fill out the paperwork faster with fewer mistakes. And that was slowing me down because I would be sitting there doing paaperwork when I should have been having those strategic conversations with folks. That's right. And so, you know, what I've learned now is strategic ignorance. If you can be ignorant, then you can relieve yourself of a lot of the obligation. So someone once said, Mark, if you don't know how to start the lawnmower, you don't have to cut the grass. And I love that. I love that. So how can I help somebody else do it 80% as well as I could? Because, you know, our, our, our entrepreneurial messiah complexes, we all think we can do it better than anyone else. But That's the right. truth is, if we can just give ourselves a little grace and give our staff a little bit of grace, if they can do it 80% as well, just let them have it. Yep. Let them fail forward. They'll be happier. You'll be happier, and you'll grow as a result. Yeah, love it. It's a it's a it's a thick answer, and I could press on you on that. But man, it seems like there's been there's been some circumstances there. I think that the paperwork thing is just such an easy like across all industries. If you're listening right now, doing any sort of paperwork as an entrepreneur, there's just it just there's just so many more higher lever activities for for markets. You know, having strategic conversations. This being one of them. You know, this is what strategic yeah. conversations look like in 2023, right? So I appreciate that. Okay, I've got a question for you about family because you you've given us very very you know what I would even say wholesome perspective on money and making decisions as an entrepreneur. We're all in, and I can already feel that the energy that you bring to this, even to this call. Like I'm sure your your pod is just the same, but <clears throat> like you're in it. I can feel it. But how have you been able to go all in 
with marriage, family, you know, health, like you said, you're trying to get maybe a little bit bigger. How are you obsessed in those things at the same time? Because I don't believe in balance. I don't know. You're pretty conservative. What do you think? You know, I literally was going to say, I don't believe in balance. So that's yeah. crazy that you were saying that. Balance in physics is just overcorrecting the last mistake you made. You know, if you think about it, if you're on a tight wire or whatever, a high wire, yeah. you're just overcorrecting your last mistake and back and forth. And balance is not in and of itself a goal. It, it, most of the time, you're, you're walking somewhere. You know, yeah. even every step you take is a balancing act on the floor. That's right. But you're hopefully moving in the right direction. And in fact, that should be my hope is that for your entrepreneurial uh, un audience, that your balance is leading to an end somewhere. Yeah. You know, balance ultimately will, will be, it's fine. And ultimately, you know, when you're dead, that's the ultimate balance because you're like at one with nature, literally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so balance brings me to abundance is what I aim for. Like, I think you'd be the same. I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on this, but how can I have a life where I love my wife more every day? Yeah. How can I be a, the kind of man where my family loves to be around me? How can I be in the best shape I've ever been in my life? I write these out every single morning, these and several other affirmations, because I want that to be the focus or the, I guess the, the end goal of the balance that I seek to achieve. I, I check out every 4.30 PM. I'm done with this work thing and I'm on to dad duty. You know, I want to be with my, with my daughter. I want to spend time with my, my family. And so I do find that time balance, but it's for the purpose of abundance. Give me your thoughts on, on that though. What do you think? Yeah, I think that you gave a just a really, really great response. I mean, I think that you're you're headed towards something for us, and even especially inside of Gathering the Kings, we call it the exceptional life, and the exceptional life is made up all of these different areas. And so you've done a great job here. It's business, finance, it's it's marriage, it's family, it's spiritual, it's it's uh, lifestyle, it's health, emotional, physical. I mean, all these different dimensions, as we say, of kingship matter. But I but if I'm if I'm actually focused on balance, like you said, that I'm not focused on getting who to or toward the exceptional life, I'm, I'm worried about, am I spending the same amount of time in balance or in, in business as I am in family or the same amount at the gym as I am with my family? It's like, well, wait a second. I don't actually need to spend eight hours at the gym like I do my business. So I can't actually balance this. How this is not even possible any, any longer. So right. when someone just goes like a, a layer or two, you know, I think it, it illuminates quite a bit, like you're saying. It sure does. And if we do it right, we'll look like hypocrites, you know, because you know, we honestly will never be able to achieve. I think, you know, yeah. the, the best picture I have in my mind for where this all goes is a rocket ship. You know, you know, th there's so much packed potential in the core of that rocket ship, all sure. the fuel and everything. And to lift off the ground, it needs balance, but it's not just sitting there to levitate. It's sitting there to go to the moon or wherever you want to take that rocket ship. Also, the concept of potential comes into play here because if you just sit on that rocket launch pad for decades, that's a shame, you know, yeah. but you need to activate your potential really building toward a goal. And honestly, that's what helps you balance. If you think about it, like if you're always staring at your feet when you're on that tight wire or high wire, or whatever they call it, you're more likely to fall. But if you're looking forward, you know, toward the, the end goal, oftentimes I can balance better. I don't know if that's a human thing or not, but yeah, it seems to be. When you're an entrepreneur, if you're focused on today and the problems of today and finding balance today, you'll stress yourself out. But uh, your mastermind, your podcast, it's helping all of us get a sense of where we could go to become more than the person we are today, which I think is what it means to activate our potential. Yeah, love it. I got one last question here for you, Mark. I want to know if you had the chance to reach back into time and you tap the younger Mark on the shoulder and you whisper in his ear, what do you tell that guy? You know, I've, I've been asked this question before. I've thought about it too. It's really, I don't know, because there's nothing that I would say. I guess you get to choose your regrets in life, but I don't really think there's anything I would want to say to, to younger Mark because the trials, the troubles, the joys, the surprises right. are all part of what helps us here. Yeah. I, I guess I'll try to get it down the ladder some. And I would say, hey, you know, don't be afraid to start big. I think my biggest problem was I started with dipping my toe in yeah. and yeah, I had to get over my own bias and my own fears really of starting a business. Yeah. But by listening to my wife and kind of listening to people who were cheering me on, starting a business was 
one of the best financial moves we ever made. It's changed our family tree and more. Yeah. And yeah, there's going to be failures, but man, dive in. Don't just dip your toe in. You'll end up being happier as a result. Even if you're just selling lemonade for three years, if you dive in whole hog, right, you're going to be successful. If you just hone in and don't waver between two different you know, lives, you know, you can't keep that day job if you're going to go whole hog on this business thing, for example. Love the answer. Love your poise. Where can the listener find you? Number one, you've already mentioned your show. Give us the deets on that, as well as if they're interested in having a conversation with you on this snowbank methodology or just how they can build wealth with you. How can they find you? Yeah. Yeah, the snowbank method uses something called bank on yourself type whole life. That's a, that's a trademark term by Pamela Yellen. She wrote the book behind me, Bank on Yourself Revolution. You guys can check that book out if you're readers. If you like podcasts, listen to our show. It's called Not Your Average Financial Podcast. That's Not Your Average Financial Podcast. And if you want to chat with me and imagine what it would look like to have this strategy of bank on yourself incorporated into your life, your business, reach out. I'd be happy to chat or one of my colleagues and I could meet with you. For 15 minutes to answer questions, you can find me at kickstartwithmark.com. That's kickstartwithmark, with a K.com. Love it. We'll put all that in the show notes as well. So if you've listened here today and thought Mark is a sharp guy like I have, <laughs> then you should be able to find his information below and connect with him easily. Mark, wow, you're an incredible human. You have uh, so much momentum. I can just feel it. It, it seeps out of your, your being. Thank you for being here. Blessings to your family, blessings to your business, you. all the clients that you're helping, and, and of course your show. I'm sure that's going to continue to grow as well. Thanks for being here, buddy. Thanks, Jazz. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight, and nine figure business owners, is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.